Hey, welcome to the Virtually Speaking podcast series on VMware Cloud Foundation, Inside Private Cloud. On this episode, we're talking about uh, VMware vDefend. It's a security offering inside of VCF. John, how you doing, my man? I'm feeling kind of paranoid. Somebody's out to get me. Like, I got some weird text message. I don't know what's going on. Oh, yeah? You've been hacked? <laughs> Probably, you well. know. I've, I've got second factors, I've got third factors, I've got all the factors, and it's it's probably not enough, so. <laughs> well, you're in luck because we've got the expert with us to talk about security, this new security offering, as I mentioned, inside of VCF called VMware vDefend. Banu Vemula, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Um, Pete and John, thank you for inviting me, and I'm really excited to be here. My name is Banu Vemula, and I'm part of the Application Networking and Security Division within Broadcom and I lead the product marketing for security portion of the business. Yeah, and you're talking to us today because of the fact that that is one of the add-ons in this whole, you know, this whole story of VMware Cloud Foundation, VCF. And so we want to talk to you about that. And we all know security is super important to any private cloud environment. Uh, and so I just want, maybe you can help us understand how, are cust how should customers be thinking about security when we're talking about private cloud? Yeah. So when you really think about like security, right? Generally, what comes to mind is you have a private cloud, and then you want to secure your private cloud, and you want to start with like securing a perimeter of your private cloud. So it's like having like a good perimeter security to protect your private cloud is generally the first step. But we all know that just isn't enough, right? If it isn't enough, we wouldn't be uh, having this conversation, and we wouldn't be seeing like so many attacks that are happening in the industry today. So private clouds are like the analogy I would like to give you, they're like M&M. &M. It's like hard on the outside and then soft on the inside. So you need to be able to protect the inside of your private cloud because most of your traffic resides inside your private cloud. So let me explain what that means. <clears throat> if you go back like 20 years ago, when application architectures were simpler, um, that means like if you have a client server based application, it, then if you want to log into your bank account, you would just open up your browser, enter your credentials, that goes to a web server with a web page, and the web server talks to the database, yep. retrieves the information, and presents it to you. So that was like many years ago. In that type of architecture, having a perimeter security is good enough, and then you could use the same firewalls to secure the inside of your private cloud, in the example that I gave, when you have, you have a simple a application. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the model that you would do. But as you know, things change tremendously from those days, right? Today, applications are much more complex. You have sophisticated applications that have to talk to each other to give you like a simple response. So for example, take any, any social media app, like pick LinkedIn. So when you click on like a news feed, you will end up like getting a page that has like much more than the newsfeed. You will have your contacts, you will have like different professional events that are happening, and it might show like, hey, these are the people that you might want to connect. So how are you getting all that information when you just ask for give me my like newsfeed? Right? Yeah. So what happens is a simple click from you goes to a web server that generates thousands of requests inside the data center. All of them have to communicate with each other and render a page for you, and that gets presented to you. Now, all that communication happens inside the private cloud, and that's basically what we want to secure. Now, just using a traditional um, perimeter-based security isn't enough. You need to be able to secure every transaction and every communication, and that's kind of like what we do with uh, VMware, we defend, and that's how our customers should think about security. So it isn't enough to just secure in the perimeter. You need to be able to secure the inside of your perimeter. So what we offer, which, which is VMware, we defend, which I'll talk about in a bit, and it is designed to secure the inside of your private cloud. So, you know, historically for that perimeter defense, we buy what I like to call magic security boxes. You know, yeah. you get a firewall, maybe it's fancy, it's got an IDS module or something. Um, you know, you stack a couple of these, and it always was weird as a VMware admin, I would have my rack of servers, and then there was like a, a, an equivalent stack of giant magic security boxes. Yep. When I want to start doing internal security, why can't I just grab a you know more stacks and stacks of those magic security boxes and put them in front of every host? Like, where does this you know what are the challenges to this? Okay, so let me let me ask you a question. Like, uh, if you take a typical server, how many interfaces does it have? 
Okay, so yeah, either, you know, the smallest would be maybe 225s, and on the large side, it might have like 600 gig connections. Right. So a typical, I mean, let's just take a basic server. It has like two 10 gig ports. That's like yep. 20 gig traffic. Yep. Now, you take any firewall out there, hardware-based firewall, a typical market firewall would be around like 60 gig or maybe like 120 gig and a little bit more than that. Yeah. Now, if you do the math, a small like 50 server footprint can quickly overrun many number of firewalls. So these firewalls were never really designed to handle the traffic that's inside your private cloud. They were always designed to handle the security at the perimeter where the traffic volumes are much traffic, lower, like the north-south, exactly, north-south is where you where they would help you but inside they don't have the in, uh, capacity to secure all your traffic so meaning like you have many many workloads and how do you secure each workload that's kind of like where we help secure all your vSphere workload because we, we sit inside the vSphere and that's the differentiation that we have and that's the platform we have which is designed to secure the massive scale inside a data center or inside your private cloud yeah, because obviously, I, I I don't know why I thought about this immediately, but I, I thought of like a bodyguard at like a club or something. You know, they'll they'll, they'll see who's coming in yeah. or not, and that's fine. But once you're in, right, then you're in. Like exactly, it, once you're in, you're in. Yes. Yeah, then yes. Not, they're not still looking. I bet Peter, 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 Peter to the bar, and he's being weird, and <laughs> okay, no one's okay. paying attention. So, all right, so yeah ransomware right like so yeah. i in that case you know if, if there's like a ransomware attack what what exactly happens during a ransomware attack say they've gotten past that perimeter how do we know you know that a ransomware attack is there and then what do we do okay so let's talk about ransomware before we talk about ransomware john like i just want to say that you have a really nice hat and i love your there hat you can't, you can't I, sew my hat. I, 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 I know I'm you're a, trying to sew my hat. So. <laughs> so I'm a fan of cowboy hats. I grew up watching all the spaghetti western movies. Oh, cool. Clint Eastwood is my like favorite, and I always wanted one. I actually have many of them, but yours looks really cool. Uh, do you think I, you can help me get one? I, I think I can direct you to, to the right hat vendor. Would you? Yeah. So when you see like something nice, would you like send me an email and just send me a picture? Yeah. I yeah. can let you know if I, if I like it or not. Yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you an email. In fact, I'll, I'll make sure to include a uh, you know a, you know lots of links uh, of dubious uh, you know origin. Don't worry, okay. that'll be. Okay. But now let's talk about ransomware. Okay, thank you for that, and I'm I'm going to look forward for your email, John. I'm really excited with the thought of getting like such a nice hat. So now let's come back to ransomware, which is an important topic. So what is ransomware? So ransomware is a type of malware. Uh, malware is short for malicious software. So this is a type of software that's intentionally designed to cause harm to your computers, to your users, and to your networks. This could be like your uh, Trojan horses, like your viruses, your worms, your spyware, ransomware. It's like one of them, right? Sure. So the main purpose of these uh, ransomware attacks is to get into your network, identify like the most important asset that you have, steal and then encrypt, and then demand for ransom, which is growing at an alarming rate um, I mean, that's an important concern for like most of our customers. Now, John, like we talked about the hat, so a week from now, uh, if I get an email from you saying that, hey, Banu, like I know you like the cowboy hat, so let me, uh, this is a picture that I found, and what do you think of it, right? So instinctively, what I would do is I would just say, this is from John, let me click on it and see. Uh, if I like the hat or not. Yeah, that's your first mistake, and boom, go ahead. <laughs> that's exactly how uh, an attacker gets inside your network. And now let's talk about ransomware itself. So ransomware, uh, like I said, it's a type of malware. And most of these malware attacks, they happen in a sequence. So you can break down a ransomware attack or any type of malware into three different stages. The first one is called the initial access, which is what we just discussed. Somebody sends an email, you end up clicking on a link, or you end up like downloading a file, or maybe like there are other ways too. So there are multiple ways how you actually get initial access. That's just one bucket of it. Now, once they get in, it isn't a big deal if you log into a lab server, if you get, uh, if you get hacked into a server that isn't really important, right? So in the initial access phase, there is not much of a damage that really happens. It's just an intruder gains access to your network and then sit there. Now, they sit there for a really long time. The industry data shows, on an average, it takes 200 days oh, wow. for an intruder to find a valuable asset 
inside your network and cause the damage. Now, 200 days, to put that in context, uh, now we're in April, right? It takes about like next year, February, which is around like Valentine's Day. So till that time, the attacker is inside your network. Imagine like if somebody breaks into your house, goes from room to room, looking at your tax records and listening to your stories and listening to your conversations. I'm imagining that is broken into my house. Right? Yeah, living in my attic for a hundred days, like yeah. snooping through my stuff, like yeah. That's unthinkable, right? Yeah. Now it's the same thing for network too. Your private cloud is your valuable asset. You don't want somebody inside your network, right? So what they do is they they be inside your network and they spend like they try to do a little recon and identify the valuable assets that you have, and then finally like find something that's, that's, that's valuable for them. And then this is what they do. So let's just say they find a database server with credit card information or like social security numbers. So first they encrypt the, first they steal the data, they encrypt the machine, and then demand you for ransom. So now something interesting happens here. They already have your data. So when you pay the ransom, they might give you keys to decrypt what you already have. Yeah. But they already have the data. So they could sell the data on the black market, and that's called double extortion. And what's even worse is because they have access to your data, they can find your customers and your partners, call them, and threaten them that they're going to expose that their data. And that's called like triple extortion. So in the big picture, a ransomware no, attack. Want quadruple extortion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm just, there are always creative ways, John. People always find creative ways to extract, like uh, take uh, take advantage of like good people. So uh, to summarize, a ransomware attack can be broken at three different stages: the initial access stage, and then the lateral movement, which is where like they spend a lot of time inside your private cloud, okay. and then ransoming, meaning encrypting and stealing your data, and then demanding for ransom. That's the st third stage. So that's essentially what a ransomware attack is. So, so how do we identify each of those stages and, and break that chain, I guess, through there? Yeah, so that's basically like uh, what uh, <clears throat> VMware vDefend for VCF does, right? So what is VMware vDefend? So VMware vDefend is a layer two to layer seven software-defined security solution that is designed to protect the inside of your private cloud and, and protect from things such as like ransomware attacks and then help you achieve zero trust architecture and accelerate your journey to get to zero trust and help protect your private cloud. And we defend has many capabilities. Now to answer your question, how do I know what stage I'm in and how can I protect myself from each of these stages, right? So let me kind of like break down what's inside a we defend and how we can help you protect yourself from these three different stages. So. Let's go back to the example. Um, so when I get an email from you with a picture of a hat, I click on it, right? So that's the initial access phase. In the initial access phase, there are generally the three different techniques that are used to detect malware or malicious files. First one is called hash-based hash -based lookup. So what it does is it looks at like known signatures and making sure there is a hash and there is a match for it and you can tell it's a good or bad and based on that either you accept the file or reject the file. And the second one is static analysis. So static analysis is you observe the file, you look at what's inside, you look at the code, but you don't necessarily execute on it. Based on what's inside, you come up with a confidence score, and depending on what the score is, you might say the file is okay, or maybe it isn't okay. That's where you go to the dynamic analysis, which is a key component of our redefined solution, and we call it a sandbox. What it does is, it opens up that file inside a controlled environment, we call it a sandbox, and it looks for different aspects of it. So for example, like when you get a file, um, these days modern malware, you don't even write that to the disk. They run, execute themselves from the memory. Yeah, right. So we look at the memory, we analyze the memory, we call it memory analysis, where we look at the binaries, and then feed that to our machine learning model to detect any kind of malicious behavior. So that's like one technique. And then we use a different technique called e-code genie, meaning like attackers, um, like everybody else, they have access to all sorts of data. So to write a sophisticated attack, it takes time. So what do attackers do? 
they basically like uh, go out and then copy the code from known malicious software and then they start using it. Now we have a huge database of that known malicious code and then we fingerprint them. It's like well, think of like a database. Use code just like I do. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So is there a stack exchange for malware? Like this is what I'm imagining. <laughs> exactly, so. exactly. So that's basically like, um, so the second part of it is we look at like the code to see if there is a known, known malicious code that is being used and then we block that, right? And the third one is really the behavior based, right? So the behavior is, see, somebody hacks into your mortgage app, they're not gonna pay your mortgage. They're gonna steal something, right? Yeah. So. I mean, a man can dream. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, like I, I would like somebody to pay my mortgage too. So, but what I'm saying is, um, the behavior of a malicious actor is always going to be malicious. It's suspicious, right? But it's hard for us to kind of like find out. That's where we feed the behavior into the machine learning models and then detect any type of suspicious behavior. Okay, so, so like the AI will, based on the behavior, determine whether or not this is normal activity or this is actually suspect based on what, what's happening. All right, exactly. so I, yeah, I, so that's the I whole... send you this hat photo, yeah. and it's like, oh, it's a hat photo, it's a link to, you know, standard how it works in WagoTexas.com. Okay, this looks fairly normal versus like, oh, the link is to hats.ru. Um, yeah. Okay, um, and it's like a weird self-generated subdomain, and, you know, you click on the link, and there's a, a py some Python script executing, doing all kinds of weird stuff in memory. It's like, okay, this this is sketchy. I don't know what this is, but this is probably bad. Like, there's... Now, that's all done inside the sandbox. Okay. So it's a contained environment. We open up the file, and then we look for this malicious behavior. And the minute we find this malicious behavior, we block that. And this is something called, like, we call this, like, zero-day threats. So most threats, like, you end up, like, using threats that existed for a long time. And sometimes um, hackers create sophisticated threats. It's called a zero-day threat, meaning this, this is a new threat that has never been seen before. Yeah. Those are pretty complex. And those are the kind of things where the sandbox will help, like you, you talked about, doing stuff that you shouldn't be normally doing, which in a contained we environment. Seen this binary. We haven't seen this attack. We don't have a signature for IDS yeah. yet, but this just smells weird. Exactly. Know? So that's the initial access portion where the sandbox piece of BDefend will help you protect from these kind of malicious, malicious files and stuff, right? Now, like I talked about, the system on which you initially get access, it, it isn't really the place where there's a lot of data, right? So contractor laptop, you know. Yes. Running. Exactly. So, so something unpatched like printer. exact unpatched printer. It could be anything. Now, from there, they stay for like 200 days that we talked about, right? What do they do? For example, if it is me, since I clicked on the picture, and I work in a product team, so. I mean, I have access to like pretty sensitive data and I have access to like the, all the product stuff that we do and everything. But at the same time, I don't have access to many things either. For example, I don't have access to our software code itself, the schematics, because I'm not an engineer writing code anymore. So I wouldn't know, I wouldn't have access to those things, right? Now, how do you separate like me from accessing all these type of things that I shouldn't, which is pretty foundational. So I'm a product guy and I'm going to do the product stuff and then I'm not doing like other stuff that I shouldn't be doing. So how would you segment, right? So if you take your private cloud, you can actually segment your private cloud into, you can start with like a big macro segmentation or like a zone based segmentation, product team, dev team, test team, marketing team, sales team. So that's pretty basic. Now what's kind of like, how does VDefend help you? So we define, we give you ability to do everything in software. And uh, we are in every hypervisor. Imagine like you have like thousands of your servers. Like we talked about the example, you asked me a question about like, why can't you do the tax of servers before? Um, we, like we I discussed- I remember what we a 40 gig firewall costs and I'm trying to imagine one of those for every host. And you know, that'd be, it costs a lot more than my host would. Exactly. So we are in every hypervisor and then a component of the VDefend is a distributed firewall, and it's on every hypervisor. And it's fully defined in software, it's fully automated, and it gives you very sophisticated models to like automate your network and security. So you can define policies in software and based on tags and create like groups and policies, not writing like a policy based on this IP should not talk to this IP. These days, applications are like all sorts of applications. They're like VM-based applications, container-based applications. There are some bare metals and all of it, right? 
So we give you ability to write policies in software um, in a fully automated way. So that's the policy model that we have with distributed firewall, which sits on every hypervisor. As a result, you not only get to enforce the policies on every host, but you also get visibility. Now, so if you have like VM-based VM -based workloads, you can use the distributed firewall. Now, most of our customers um, are, are at different phases of journey to using mixed type of workloads, meaning that you could have like container-based workloads. Yep, yep. Um, or you could have some workloads that are still like physical servers, which you still need to use, right? So for container-based workloads, uh, we offer something called um, Container Network Interface, CNI, uh, called Antrea. So Antrea is designed to secure your container-based workloads. It works hand-in-hand -hand with your distributed firewall, and then you get to manage both the container-based workloads and the uh, VM-based workloads from like one interface. You can okay, write but the it's all under VMware vDefend. All under VMware vDefend. Oh, so I don't have to have a separate product line for my containers. It's and I'm I'm not like trying to do something weird like buy one pix, you know, per. I'm gonna date myself. Say one pix per container or something like. <laughs> yeah, not gonna work. I remember that long time ago. Yeah, yeah. I was reaching for that. Asa Firewall, go ahead. Exactly. So you have the VM-based workloads we talked about, the container-based workload, and then for the physical workload. We actually offer you like a couple of different ways to secure those, right? One, we have something called a gateway firewall. And that firewall can be used to zone out all your physical servers. And then you get to manage that gateway firewall along with the firewalls that are sitting on every hypervisor and with your containers. That's like one way to do it. And then we also offer agent-based solutions for like physical workloads, like popular workloads such as like Windows and Linux. We have we offer agents and you can deploy those as well. So um, NetNet, the the first step towards like stopping lateral movement is to make sure that you have properly segmented network, and we offer a distributed firewall, gateway firewall, and then agents and then the container network interface to protect all your workloads, not just VMware workloads. You can get the VMware workloads, and then you can protect your container-based workloads, and then you can protect your uh, physical workloads and all of them managed from one interface. That's pretty powerful, pretty, pretty I mean, sophisticated. Th this is impressive because back in my day, if I wanted to segment something, I had to play a completely different subnet. I had to route, send it out to a router. It had to physically go through a, a magic box. And you, you basically had a trade off perpetually of um, how many subnets I wanted to generate and how many, you know, how, much, how many tickets I wanted to open with my networking yeah, team. Yeah. Um, you know, the throughput potentially, like if my backups are going through this, yeah. I would have hosed the poor boxes. And then on on top of that, you know, it's just my laziness of like, you know what, let's just put everything on a slash 16 and, you know, not worry about it. So like that trade-off of operational overhead, not even the cost of these boxes, not yeah. even the capital, the OPEX of of all of those activities to spin up one more subnet, one more subnet, to segment this stuff, but instead have this to where I can, I can automate this at a single layer and then you have the equivalent of everything being on a slash 31, everything on its own direct network. That's powerful. It, it is pretty powerful. And the automation is the key. Um, it's like ability to like manage everything from one place is like really like, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it, makes, it makes it easy for you to like uh, get 100% security and visibility in your network. Now, let's talk about like visibility as well, right? When you have to configure like segments and try to identify, first you need to know what applications that you have in your network and how they're communicating with each other. Yeah, because everyone's data centers in Greenfield. Need to. You know, it's great if you're, just, if you're deploying a new app, you can sit yeah. down on the architects and go, okay, give me the port map from the start, but sure. there's all these apps that already exist. Yeah, and you have apps that exist and you want to know, like, uh, because segmentation and micro-segmentation is like new for like most of our customers, right? I know it has been around for a long time, yeah. but uh, it still takes like a lot of planning to make sure that you write the type of policies, right? So for that, we offer a tool within the VDefend called Intelligence. What it does is it looks at all your applications inside your data center, and then it helps you like group them together based on known constructs, like you're using your uh, whatever construct you have in your. This is a DNS server. It's using yeah. You know, I see bind. You, it's using port yeah. fifty three. You know. UDP so SP. group application is like a SAP application. There's something else. So you help them group. And then it will show you like how what is the existing communication, and then it will listen and pay attention to your network for like days, and then it comes with the recommendation engine. It has a powerful recommendation engine built based on machine learning, and it will recommend set of policies that you can actually use and deploy. 
Now, you don't have to think the policies as they are. Uh, they are just recommended, which makes your life easier. And then you get to actually modify those policies and then tune them to your business needs. And then with one click, you can push. So you can do this with the user interface or you can automate the whole thing with APIs. Oh, wow. So I can, so we give I can both brownfield choices. secure my environment without taking a huge risk that I'm going to break things. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. So that's kind of the whole point. And, and then like when we have like, we were building like uh, many features to help uh, uh, help customers like uh, get to like the zero trust, right? Because when you talk about zero trust architecture, um, one of the foundation elements is you want to make sure that you have core building blocks of like who should talk to who, who shouldn't talk to who, right? So getting that place is is basically the segmentation, which is our distributed firewall and gate for firewall will help you. And the intelligence tool will actually help you simplify their journey to configure policies. And now intelligence also does something interesting, which is very unique. Um, there are two parts of it. One, um, it's built into the VDefend. So what it, what it does is when it discusses its policies, you get to actually use those and then they are based off your existing constructs. And so that means creating tags and groups becomes much easier. Versus if you use something else, it will give you a bunch of IPs and you need to map those to your host names or user names and then load them into the system. And then anytime you have to make a change, it becomes cumbersome. So we, we automate that process as which is So it's like an object centric security ACL management versus just, you know, a bunch of IPs and a bunch of IPs. Yeah, it's like a declarative or, model you know. and you get that uh, automation with, uh, with with the intelligence, which is kind of like using the known constructs that you already have within your system, right? So that's one part. And the second part, it also looks at like your uh, traffic because it's on every host. It can actually, this is where we are talking about more like the second stage, which is the lateral movement. We talked about initial access, right. and we talked about in the lateral movement, there is one segmenting the foundation block, which we discussed. And then you also want to like see if detect threats based on behavior. So if behavior based threats, meaning like, so for example, in the place where I live, we have a common mailbox place where we go and pick up the mail. Sure. So I always see like people stopping by and then picking up the mail. But then we also have this problem of people stealing mail. So if you observe the person who is stealing, he goes from one place to different place, different cul-de-sac, different place, and then that's stealing, right? If you look one at all of the it. Box, yeah, if you're, if you're opening 10 mailboxes. Exactly. Yeah. So now, how it's, it is pretty hard to actually see what this person is doing at different, in different streets. So because we are on every hypervisor, we get to see 100% of the traffic. And as a result, we can identify anomalous behavior. Ah, okay. So that capability of VDefend is called network traffic analysis. We call it NTA. So NTA will basically flag suspicious behavior. And we have many detectors that are designed to detect different aspects of uh, anomalous behavior. And one of the examples uh, would be, let's just an attacker got inside your network, and then at some point, the attacker has to contact the command and control server. Now, if you just go to the command and control server, most firewalls will block that, because there are well-established technology capabilities that exist out there, right? It's the bodyguard. Yeah. But what they do, they're evasive, so they know that part. So they try to like come up with, like, let's just, I want to go to these 100 different websites. All of them are brand new. And one of them happens to be the command and control. So for a firewall sitting in the perimeter, it, it hasn't seen them, so it'll just allow them, right? But with the NTA capability that we have, since we are on every host, and we are actually monitoring what is happening, over time, we build a profile for you to know what's normal and what's not normal. Okay. And we have a domain generation algorithm that will detect this type of like behavior. Oh so yeah, because pretty things, powerful. Yeah, I remember seeing like how those attacks work. Is it, it'll have like a polymorphic algorithm that it's just constantly generating new potential DNS combinations based on time to look for. Yeah. And I guess yeah, they all these domains always look like someone fell asleep on their keyboard or something. Um, you know, it's like what is this Klingon? Like no, it's but yeah, being able to detect that that like hey, why is the system trying random domain combinations that yeah. no one's ever seen before that are bizarre? And it's it's hitting just random ones constantly, trying to find one that it can establish a connection to. Exactly. That's yeah, that's that's suspicious, or as I like to call it, peat behavior. 
<laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know if it is speed behavior, but uh, I can tell you like we have pretty powerful uh, platform. NPA. NPA. So now. Um, the, the, what you said is absolutely right. And the differentiation that we offer with VDefend is the fact we are in every hypervisor makes it easy for us to detect anomalous behavior. Now, there are many machine learning algorithms that will detect this type of behavior, right? But they rely on data. So what you send to them is what they rely on. You, on you don't send all you of have to syslog exactly. all the things, send it all to syslog, and then the SOC runs tools against that versus you're sitting there in the raw, you know, S-flow, J-flow, NetFlow, whatever. Everything. We're sitting on every hypervisor, so we get to see a lot more, right? So that's the second type of way how we block uh, the lateral movement. So when an attacker is sitting inside your network for 200 days, and we actually find you pretty quick and then evict you before you can do any real damage. That's the other aspect of it. Now, the third stage we talked about is the when they find the crown jewel, they steal the data, they encrypt, and that's called exfiltration, data exfiltration. So the data exfiltration, we have something called the distributed IDS and IPS. So IDS, IPS is a technology that existed for a really long time. So what is it so different about our IDS, IPS? One, it's distributed everywhere, so you get to manage it from one place. And then the fact it's on every hypervisor, it makes it easy to block this type of attacks. So in this example, when you're trying to steal data, we can actually look at um, this type of behavior based on signatures and then block that. So that's like one use case of IDS IPS. But there are a couple of more that are very interesting, which we find a lot of our customers use. Uh, one is the compliance. So in a regulated environment, if you're in like healthcare or like uh, financial services company, you have to adhere to different type of compliance like PCI or like HIPAA. So one of the things that happens uh, in these environments is every quarter you have to do an audit. An auditor will come, uh, will look at like what you have and they will ask you, hey, have you secured this type of traffic? Do you have this type of rules? Normally doing that is pretty cumbersome. If you are like the admin that's responsible for doing this, working with the auditor, you have to track all these things and figure out like what you configured, what you didn't configure. Well, we forgot to patch. Yeah, and with us, it becomes much simpler because since you are on every host, we you just have one place to pull up, look at all the configs that you configured and look at what type of traffic you're applying. And it makes um, it, their job, like the auditor's job and the admin's job much easier. We have the like, customers that actually do this today and then we have like case studies published. So that's like one use case which is on compliance. Now, there is a different use case called virtual patching. So what that means is, let's just say every month you find out that your, your network is exposed to like X number of vulnerabilities. Yep. Now, we all know going and patching all the servers every other week or like every other month isn't really practical, right? Mm -hmm. So most customers will always end up in a situation where they know they're running machines that are exposed to certain type of vulnerabilities. They know they have to fix them, but like you can't fix it immediately. The patch might break something or they haven't had yeah time. They have to schedule a maintenance window. Yeah. And then that's like cost money for the businesses. Oh, yeah. So so because we are in every hypervisor, the IDS IPS, you can actually, as soon as there is a signature, you can go and turn that on with a simple policy so that your server is still running the software that's exposed to vulnerability but your server, your workload runs on the VMware hypervisor, which has the IDS IPS, so we block it right there. So it's called a virtual patching. A lot of our customers are love this solution because it gives them ability to like think, what is my strategy in terms of like uh, upgrading these servers, right? So it's a pretty um, a popular feature that a lot of our customers use. Especially with these distributed applications, where it was just a web server and a database, okay, this version of web is compatible with this database. Now with microservices and things are talking to 50 places, figuring out the the right order of patches or the implications is hard. So that having that thing to sit there in the middle, but I mean, historically, I remember IDS is those things on a, on a cost per gigabit of throughput were the most expensive thing in the data center. Not only they are expensive, they offer limited capacity. You get like five gig, 10 gig, or maybe a little bit more. Yeah. And then they sit outside your network. So they don't have the context of your applications. We have the context of applications because we know what apps you have. 
that gives us ability to reduce the number of signatures we have to run per workload versus sitting um, on the side of your network where you're running thousands of signatures, right? So as you can imagine, our IDSIP is pretty efficient. Uh, we take advantage of the distributed nature of our solution itself. As a result, we get to like do a lot of things which, uh, which, which, which only we can do. Yeah, because yeah, of the platform scale. you have. Well, it's, you know, I have a firewall at my house, and if I turn on the IDS function, the throughput of it gets cut to like a third, and then the CPU oh, packs yeah. at 100. M most firewalls do. I mean, but you turn on the IDS IPS feature, your throughput my, gets cut in the half. Yeah, and my little firewall is running, I'm sure, a little tiny Intel Celery or some, you know, you know, very, you know, meager ARM processor, but I start thinking of these hosts that have 80, you know, beefy platinum cores, and then you have dozens and dozens of those. That's, a, that's slightly less intimidating in terms of the scope of that impact. So that's like the IDS IPS will help you the third stage of a ransomware attack, right? So we talked about initial access, the sandbox, and the lateral movement, we talked about the distributed firewall, gateway firewall, NTA, and then the last one we talked about the IDS IPS, which will help you with the exfiltration. Now, with all these things, uh, you, we talked about uh, attacker being inside your network for 200 days. So how can you tell if there is an attacker already inside your network? There might be. There might not be, you don't know, right? So how do you actually identify this? So for that, we offer something called Network Detection and Response. It's called NDR, part of the vDefend. So what it does is it collects uh, information on events and all these atomic events from different um, sources. For example, your IDS IPS log and your NTA logs and events and correlate all of those and tell you a story in a visual way. Okay. So with our NDR, you can actually see if there is an attacker or if there is a campaign that is happening inside your network today and map it to the MITRE attack framework. MITRE attack framework is a pretty common framework that uh, security professionals use, which will map an attack or a campaign to different uh, stages uh, within a kill chain Yep. And then it'll tell you if you have any existing campaigns. And if you do, how many you have. And what systems are impacted. And what stage each of these attacks are. So an example would be, let's just say you have two campaigns. Uh, first campaign could be in the initial access phase. And the second campaign could be data exfiltration phase. Now, as a SOC admin, you know, like the most important thing is to look at the one that is in the data exfiltration stage, that initial access. Because now we know initial access is just initial access. The damage happens when they find the crown jewel and then exfiltrate, right? So you know how to prioritize. So the solution that we offer, the NDR, is part of our advanced threat prevention um, offer. Um, it's probably the most differenti differentiated solution that we offer because I believe we are the only vendor out there who is able to correlate uh, these different events from multiple sources like your IDS IPS and your NTA and then different like your sandbox. Our, architect our architecture is pretty flexible to collect inputs from different uh, tech capabilities within the vDefend, correlate them and tell you a story visually of what is happening which will help you prioritize where you need to go. So that's comprehensively uh, what vDefend does. Like vDefend basically has all these elements of your distributor firewall, your gateway firewall for the basic foundation blocks of like segmentation. And then you have these advanced prevention capabilities like the sandbox for initial access and mostly for malware files. And then you have the NTA portion for like detecting anomalies and your NDR for like stitching all this together and giving you a way to like visualize these things. And then you can also like uh, close loop. It's like a, um, you can actually take a remediation act action as well if something happens, right? Um, it's pretty sophisticated solution. Why vDefend for VCF? Like what is the better together? Yeah. So there are three reasons why you want to consider vDefend for VCF. One, like we discussed, vDefend is pretty comprehensive. Different capabilities that I discussed are actually products you can buy from different vendors. And if you do that, then you have to integrate between each other. And then we all know integrating different uh, products is not easy. So we do that for you. So we, we defend is the most comprehensive solution that's out there.
to protect the inside of your private cloud. And we, we integrate like every component of it. So we know uh, we get the visibility from your infrastructure and we get, we get to take action on different type of actions based on like behavior versus like policies and all that. So that's like one reason. And the second one, um, if you are building a private cloud with VCF, there is absolutely no reason to think about something else because we are right there in the hypervisor. It's for you to turn it on. So we, are a, we give you a plug and play experience with VCF. Uh, VCF has um, the different domains. We help you protect all your domains and between domains and your management traffic and all of it. It's, it's there built into the VCF. So that's like the second reason, right? And the third one, as a customer, as you embark on your journey to build your private cloud, you want to kind of like, it, it, we make it easy for you to get support from like one vendor. So if you have any issues with your infrastructure of VCF, including security or even load balancing and all of it, you give us a call and we help you, right? So if you think of it, that translates to total cost of ownership. So over time, having this thing deployed together will, will, cost, will save you in terms of your cost and resources and management and you don't have to go between like different vendors trying to figure out or whose problem it is and whatnot, right? So it's the, if you are building a private cloud with CF, I would say this would be a natural fit for you to like uh, take advantage. It's just there in the uh, vSphere. You just turn it on and you get the full advantage of it. Nice. I love it. That is a comprehensive explanation of what VMware vDefend is. And uh, yeah, so where can people go to learn more about this if they're interested in, in, in taking advantage of this? Yeah, so uh, you would go to our like website. If you go down the product section, you will see like... Uh, you will see like VMware um, um, in distribute, we defend distributed firewall, and then VMware um, we defend advanced threat prevention. Okay, those are the two um, pages that you would go, and then you can get like a lot of information from there. Yeah, and for our listeners, if you're interested, just reach out to John, and he will send you an email. Uh, and uh, just just <laughs> just feel just feel yeah. free to click on that email. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 yeah, please click on the email. Please don't. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, this has been a great explanation. Uh, we will refer folks in the show notes of this episode uh, for all the uh, all the. I know there's a new blog that talks about it, so we'll share that as well. And uh, yeah, and and for those interested, by all means. Uh, Click on the links below to learn more about VMware vDefend. Banu, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on Virtually Speaking and enjoy the rest of your day.